Okay, I think we can start because the session is quite short. So welcome everybody to this HNPW session on the cooperation and mutualization within the aid sector to address the ecological transition. My name is Aline Hubert. I work at the group UID on the environmental issues and more precisely focusing on the rejection of the environmental footprint within the aid sector. So for those uh, who don't know the group UID yet, just a few words. This is a French think tank specialized in crisis context, and we have been working on the environmental issues for many years. Um, so this session is one hour long, and if you, this is an open discussion. Um, so if you want to ask a question to the speaker, or if you want to share ideas or comments, please write into in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, before uh, letting the speaker introduce themselves, I would just say a few words of, of introduction. Um, I assume that most of you have seen that in recent years, the aid sector is at a turning point by embracing the environmental issues. Um, there's no more question whether or not we should take into account the environment. We know that. And the answer is definitely yes, both in our projects and also in our operation, the way we work on the field, because of the junior arm principle, but above all because um, the climate change and the environmental degradation are a very a real humanitarian crisis. So now the question is, how can we achieve this? And we are several people convinced that we cannot do it alone and or even separately. And that this requires um, to join our forces. So this is the very point of this uh, meeting and the, the discussion that we want to have today to underline the potentialities and the advantages of cooperation and mutualization, as well as the inconvenience and also the limits, of course. So to do that, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, our three speakers. Thank you for joining. Um, here today, we have uh, two representatives of Inspiring Network and also a donor very involved in the environmental uh, transition. So Catherine Ely, you're the REC project coordinator uh, for the Global Logistic Cluster. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I had one slide that we could pull up, if you don't mind. Francesca, can you just um, go ahead? While she's doing, there we go. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, nice to meet those of you who I haven't seen before. And nice to see um, some familiar names in the, in the list of participants here. Um, just to say really quickly, if you don't mind, if you could introduce yourself in the chat as well, so that we all know who we're speaking to and what organizations you're from, that would be super helpful. Um, but as Aline said, my name is Catherine Ely. I am the project manager for the REC project, and the REC uh, stands for Waste Management and Measuring, Reverse Logistics, Environmentally Sustainable Procurement and Transport, and Circular Economy. And we look at those topics from a uh, humanitarian supply chain uh, lens. And so the REC project is a uh, project that is led by the Global Logistics Cluster, and it includes a coalition of partners. Um, the Danish Refugee Council, the IFRC, Save the Children and World Food Program, who form a steering committee um, and support sort of our uh, guiding the, the REC project forward. But the project itself is really to uh, consolidate and compile and gather different tools, um, best practices, case studies, training and guidance that we can share with the humanitarian logistics community to support uh, sustained adoption of best environmental practices. So um, we have an information portal, which I can put into the chat and everybody can go to, but that's really the, the, the network of people that we're, we're, we're working with to try and support uh, environmental sustainability. Um, within the clusters network, we have over 500 different partners. Um, right now, the REC project has over a thousand different participants on our mailing list. So we like to try and gather as much information as possible and share um, the relevant updates via the information portal. Thank you. Aline, back over to you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, so our second speaker is Camille Théon from Handicap International or Humanity and Inclusion. And you're also a um, member of the REH steering committee. So maybe Camille, can, can you explain us what is the REH? Sure, and thanks for the invitation to participate uh, in this discussion. So, um, 
so yeah, um, humanity and inclusion, we, uh, we work in more than uh, 60 countries uh, alongside uh, people with disability, vulnerable population, and obviously um, we all know if we're here today that um, those are the people that are um, on the front line of uh, all the, um, uh, the changes, climate change and, and uh, ecological disasters are, that are uh, happening right now. And so um, obviously in the organization, we are now working on um, reducing our footprint and we're very happy um, to be doing that within the REIH, which is uh, a um, in the, the French for um, Environment Humanitarian Network. Um, so we are a network of uh, French-speaking um, uh, NGO, humanitarian NGOs, um, with some uh, non-French-speaking NGOs that have that just happen to have a French-speaking French employee on board. Um, and uh, but also uh, more than 100 uh, individuals who have joined the network. And um, the goal is all to cooperate and, and work together to address uh, the envir environmental footprint of um, humanitarian aid. Um, and we do that, uh, especially since last year, um, uh, through uh, several working groups, um, very focused on um, a concrete uh, ways to address the uh, uh, different parts of the um, the footprint of humanitarian aid, and I won't uh, say too much more because uh, I won't I don't want to spoil the rest of uh, what I'll be sharing today. Um, Thank you very much, Kami, and this is very um, this will be very useful for our discussion to rely on your examples. Uh, maybe just Francesca, can we uh, go back to the first slide, please, just to introduce our uh, last speaker. Um, so Karolina Kalinowska, your policy officer leading the environmental strategy at the DG ECHO. So I guess I don't have to introduce the DG ECHO and everybody knows you, um, but maybe you can share with us as an introductory word um, where you are, um, a brief update on your action in the direction of the reduction of the environmental footprint because uh, we know that the DG ECHO is um, at the forefront of the green transition among donors. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much, Aline. Uh, very happy to be here. And indeed, that sounds very good as a, as a means for introduction. Some of you uh, know very well our, our approach and have been following it very closely from the beginning. But indeed, for those who don't know, uh, just as a brief introduction, so essentially this year is the first year where our minimum environmental requirements are mandatory. So these are requirements that we have developed for our projects. So it's very much operations based and uh, essentially a set of environmental standards that we expect our partners to comply with in their, in their project proposals and the implementation. So last year, we uh, it was, uh, let's say the pilot or transition phase, and we did a lot of capacity building and, and indeed work both internally within ECHO and externally with our partners to get everyone uh, on the same page with regards to these requirements. And now, uh, indeed, it's the first year where they are mandatory. So we are seeing, you know, how in practice they're actually translating into the projects and then also the implementation. So we'll definitely uh, um, have to see how this uh, evolves, let's say, over time. And, and for sure, we will be focusing uh, in the months and, and, and years to come on better uh, application of these requirements. So not yet uh, changing anything, but rather focusing on uh, indeed improving uh, how partners understand them, how they translate them into the projects. And the requirements, uh, just to say before, before moving on, um, they cover uh, all the humanitarian sectors, but we also have cross-cutting requirements, uh, for example, on waste management and sustainable supply chains, which we expect to be uh, applied across the different sectors. And I can definitely go into uh, more of this later in the session. Thanks. Thank you, Carolina. And yeah, this reflects the fact that uh, there are um, both um, a challenge to reduce our environmental footprint in our project, uh, and also in the way we do the project, like for waste management, logistics, supply chain, and so on. Thank you very much. So we can move on to the agenda. 
Um, so as I said, we have only one hour for today to discuss. Um, and the discussion will be, will be divided in two parts. So first of all, we will discuss the challenges of cooperation of cooperation, sorry, between the operational actors, so be it NGOs, but also United Nations agencies. And in the second part, we will discuss the cooperation between um, donors and also the consistency um, of the different environmental policies. Um, Okay, so let's start with the first part of our discussion. And uh, my question will be uh, directed more to Catherine and Camille, of course. Um, so according to you, what are the challenges, I'm oh, sorry, what are the benefits of the mutualization and cooperation within the aid sector? And can you share with us uh, maybe concrete example to illustrate how this can help the um, operational actors to be more environmentally friendly? I don't know who wants to start. Yeah, I was going to say who wants to go first. Come here, you want to go first? Or shall yeah. I? Yes, shall I start? I'll start going. Great. And I just want to say as well, um, we, we're we trying to have this session be sort of an open discussion between us and everybody on the call. Um, so please feel free, like uh, Eileen said, raise your hand at any, at any point or feel free to write into the chat if you have any questions or comments. But in terms of... Um, benefits of, of cooperation and coordination, I think um, there are so many. Um, so I think for the logistics cluster side, um, what we're trying to, to, to sort of do with the REC project is uh, avoid the sort of duplication and, and you know, the overlap and duplication of, of sort of efforts and also of resources that are, that are allocated toward uh, creating better uh, practices and policies. So I think one thing that's it's a very clear um, benefit is the reduction of that overlap. So, for example, um, the REC project last year we had a, a session, uh, a work uh, workshop on green procurement, and it's a very hot topic. I think, um, and during that session, it was very clear to us that there were a lot of different organizations and a lot of different groups that were doing various levels of work on green procurement activities, and so from that we said, okay, there is a real risk here that people are gonna be doing the same thing with very limited resources. And so that duplication and overlap um, is possible. So let's make sure that we bring everybody together and let's coordinate amongst ourselves. Now, it's not necessarily our role to say, stop doing this, stop doing that, but it is our, our, our role and we've taken it on board to get everybody sitting around the table to give each other updates, to coordinate and collaborate with each other. So as a result of that, you know, we've learned a lot more about the detailed activities that are taking place in green procurement with different uh, working groups, different NGO uh, NGO groups, different UN agencies and working groups, so that we make sure that we are sort of building on that knowledge base and moving things forward. So I think that's one clear um, sort of benefit uh, is, is really that coordination aspect. Um, Another one, and you can stop me at any time, Camille, is sharing of best practices and, um, and case studies. So for, for example, um, the Joint Initiative worked with uh, Shelterbox to share a case study recently on the reduction of plastic packaging. Um, and that was shared, you know, that was done by Shelterbox, shared by the JI, it was shared by the REC project. I think it's now gone around sort of the humanitarian logistics sector. And a lot of people have sort of learned about what's possible um, and different ways that you can you can make changes to product uh, to product packaging um, with your manufacturers to have a reduction in that plastic. So I think sharing the, of those case studies and again avoiding the duplication and overlap are quite clear um, positive benefits of, of of cooperating and collaborating with each other. Thank you very much, Catherine. This is very interesting that you mentioned the procurement working group because several, as you said, various working group uh, on green procurement uh, was set up and that was uh, a kind of an issue to be to ensure that they are working uh, in articulation and uh, yes, in, um, in coherence between each other. Camille, do you want to share an example from the REH or yeah. other grouping of NGOs? Sure, and you know, listening to uh, Catherine on the um, the sharing of case studies, like we one of the working groups of the um, REH is uh, one working on um, environmental risk uh, analysis and um, evaluations, um, and 
one of the first thing that we did uh, when we set up this working group was um, bring everyone together. So there was, uh, I think, seven of us at the time and um, uh, put everyone in, in the same room for <laughs> a couple of days and just do that, like uh, exchange um, very freely on uh, our experience uh, using, so uh, focus on Need Plus um, to start with. Um, because that was the, the one that uh, most of us had uh, had been using, but really uh, exchanging on, you know, why it had worked in some organization, why some of them had a few couple trials here and there, and some others had managed to um, uh, use it a lot more systematically, um, how we had been using the results, um, what we had found uh, that was frustrating about the tool and what was interesting. And we, we got having that time to really um, share and exchange um, uh, for, for two days about all of this. After that, we, we came out of that, um, uh, wrote a report that we then shared with the uh, joint environmental um, uh, unit that is uh, working on the, um, the tool. And, um, and we are now cooperating with them and, and still exchanging and, and uh, linking with them re uh, regularly to participate in the improvement of the tool. Um, and uh, I think this kind of examples, like none of us, uh, you know, separately, each of us in our organization, we had been trying to use those tools. Um, we had been trying to think uh, about, you know, what was good and bad about them and how to improve their usage. But really having everyone together working on this, first it accelerated the, the thinking uh, a lot. Um, it helps, uh, you know, having people at different levels or stages of the of the process that you can discuss with, and then being there as a group then gave us, um, you know, sort of a legitimacy when we went to um, to speak with the um, the organization that was working on the tool and and. Um, and a lot of, I guess for them, it was interesting working with us because they got access to um, a, a group of NGOs that had already been uh, doing the work of, um, uh, you know, doing the analysis for them rather than sending them individual case studies. So I think this is a, a really good example of, um, you know, like something where like personally, I think I would never have had that much, um, knowledge about need plus and how to use it uh without that group and then you know within the like the question like cooperation and mutualization are uh, slightly different things or at least the different levels of uh, involvement and one of the other working groups that um hi is a part of uh, within the reh um was working on carbon and that other group like we set up at some point uh wanting to work on our uh assessing our carbon footprint and uh, if uh, some of you um, have tried to do that you'll know that uh, it's anything but easy um, and it, it's quite hard when you start with um, especially like knowing where to start and what to count and what to take into account and um, within that working group we actually pulled resources together um, to be able to hire consultants that would be able to work um, and some of the organization might have been able to, um, you know, hire consultants on their own. But in the working groups, there were clearly some NGOs that would never have had uh, the funds to get access to a consultant resource for this specific purpose. But then through the collaboration and mutualization of resources in that working group, um, we uh, managed to all together uh, decide on what we were going to count. Uh, th there was huge capacity buildup over the course of uh, almost a year. And then as we had worked with those consultants for, um, I think it was four or five months, um, uh, we, we sort of kept into the habit of, you know, meeting up um, every couple of weeks to keep talking about challenges and, and uh, learnings around assessing our carbon footprint. And I think Again, none of us um, would have gone so far with their carbon footprint assessment without the group. And we definitely um, were able to be a lot more ambitious 
um, and, and went far beyond just doing the sort of usual energy and flights uh, assessments uh, that, that you see uh, in, in the sector. So I think, yeah, for in, in our case, really, um, I think specifically on this topic of, uh, which is quite complex and often not the, the core focus on, of our organizations, neutralization and cooperation is really the, the only way we manage to uh, Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Camille and Catherine, for this, this um, very informative examples. Uh, I think we understand well the importance uh, of mutualization, both at the uh, strategic and uh, field level, to share tools, knowledge, methodology, as you say, for the carbon footprints, and also to share human resources. But, um, and I'm sure there are uh, many other examples and I'm thinking about the, um, the example of the, um, the initiative of carpooling system in Lebanon. Um, um, it's conducted by, um, by many organizations but run by uh, Cyril. Um, yeah, it's really, um, this is a really good example, but I guess you face some uh, um, challenges and also you, um, maybe you encountered some uh, obstacle to, to do that. For example, how do, you, um, how do you fund the human resources and how you share um, the budgets, for example? So maybe Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I think those are definitely some of the, the challenges is sort of looking across and saying, okay, we have a great idea. Um, perhaps amongst different NGOs and the different UN agencies, whomever is, is is sort of cooperating with each other. But then, yeah, you're right. How do you then um, not compete for those resources? So one of the, the other challenges that I was thinking of when thinking about this topic is, okay, um, we all have day jobs, right? And so working in these different um, different groups and different working groups, et cetera, one of the challenges I think that we see quite often is that there is limited resources in terms of staffing capacities. So you still have your, your normal day job, you still have everything that has to be going on, and then you're kind of volunteering for some of these additional activities. And I think that can be one of the major challenges. And what I think we don't want to happen, um, and I think none of us want it to happen within the sector, is that we're sort of um, competing with the same donors for the same activities to try and ask, oh, can we get funding for a dedicated staff to work on this, this topic, but it's within this working group and somebody else is also competing for that funding. Um, it's one of the, I think, risks um, to, to trying to coordinate, but I, I don't see it as, a, as, as something that's insurmountable. Um, just going back to the last sort of question, if I may, I wanted to add, uh, in addition to what Kimi was saying, is just having these networks of groups looking at environmental sustainability, and regardless of what level they're at, just having them exist and having, um, ha having people be aware that they are out there really helps with field-based practitioners to be able to reach out and say, I have a problem. Is anybody looking at this? Can I ask you for support instead of dedicating my um, my my limited resources in the field toward this this topic? And I think particularly as it comes to um, donor policies, right? So Carolina mentioned that this year is the minimum environmental uh, requirements sort of implementation for DG Echo projects, and it's at the project level. I think that's um, it's moving us forward right, as a humanitarian community to look at things at a project level, but it's also bringing out um, a clear understanding that there is a lack of awareness on a lot of these different topics at the field level, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of a, an opportunity, I think, um, but having those networks there, having those donor policies in place that are sort of driving, driving us forward to look at these topics and environmental sustainability um, I think is, is, a, is another benefit of, of having those networks available. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. yeah, I think in terms of challenges, I would say, uh, but that's probably, you know, that that's just true of any type of cooperation on any topic. Um, but obviously when you have several organizations that come together, um, you know, not, not all of them have the same amount of um, 
uh, resources to put into uh, that. That's exactly what Catherine was saying. Um, you know, I, and we see it in the in the REH where some of us, um, like I'm dedicated to the environment with an HI, so obviously I have a lot more time to uh, uh, allocate to uh, working within the REH compared to other organizations where maybe. Uh, the resource that is there um, uh, has a, a day job of a, a technical um, specialist or logistics specialist, um, and and obviously that creates uh, that, that that can create some tension <laughs> within the working groups because everybody is uh, uh, moving forward at different speeds, and um, and our organization all have like different focus obviously in the on the field as well we all have uh different missions and um and and despite having this common objective of uh, making those missions greener um we don't necessarily all have the same sort of priorities um uh because we don't deliver our projects in in exactly the same way like we see that when we're talking about waste where it's very interesting, where we're all very uh, happy to uh, collaborate on uh, building a, a framework for how to manage our waste. But then as we start talking about specifics, uh, you end up with someone having medical waste and then someone having, um, I don't know, construction uh, uh, material waste, and then someone having food waste. And, and all of us would focus, would like to focus more on our specific kind of waste. And and this can also uh, you know be a bit hard to uh, to manage on a on a daily basis. But overall, I think um, as I was saying before, like the the benefits of those uh, cooperation far um, are are definitely worth the slight headache of having to uh, resolve those those uh, those tensions. I think just to, to add, muted, I mean. yeah, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> this is true and. Uh, in the chat box, Max, Marta uh, adds something, another benefit for the field workers. Um, global networks are perfect platform to raise technical issues and search for expertise. Um, but I was also wondering whether, because there is um, um, there are growing uh, number of resources available to support actors in greening their um, operation and programs, but it's actually quite difficult to find its way uh, around. So I was wondering, because sometimes um, information is scattered in different websites and uh, in different organizations. So I was wondering if this is uh, a difficulty that you encounter. It's a great question. I'm not sure if you're posing it to me or Marta, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to avoid with, with the REC project is having it in too many different places. So with the REC information portal, what we've done uh, and what we are continuing to do is to you know, coordinate and cooperate with um, uh, various different partners from the, the logistics cluster, very wide uh, reach within the humanitarian logistics community um, and post and share relevant information. We've categorized it on the, the website in, um, in a number of, of different ways for you to be able to access it by sort of topic and thematic area. Um, but of course, you know, one of the things that I realized when I started working with um, with this topic uh, is that it's it's kind of a snowball effect, right? And that's one of those things that we're trying to get away from in terms of um, adding those additional coordination mechanisms is everybody's talking about green. Um, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of momentum toward environmental sustainability. Um, and that, of course, applies to the logistics sector. Um, the humanitarian logistics sector and what we're looking at is making sure that by those sort of high level thematic areas so for the REC it's it's the the acronym right like waste management greenhouse gas emissions procurement um, circular economy looking at it at that higher level and saying we need to get everybody that's working on those topics in the humanitarian sector around the table to make sure that we're avoiding that duplicate duplication and overlap but also that whatever tools and information and training that's available is shared with the humanitarian uh, logistics community so that they have it. Another thing that we're trying to do, and I think what, um, and Marta, you can feel free to step in at, at any time. Um, I agree though that what Marta mentioned here in terms of it's a perfect platform to raise technical issues and ask for help. Um, it's another thing that we're trying to do with the REC project is have dedicated expertise available to support 
when people have questions. So, you know, DG Echo's minimum environmental requirements and looking at it at a, a project level this year is a good good example. I think, um, and I've spoken with, with colleagues, um, with Carolina and colleagues at, at DG Echo, some of the people who are writing proposals and having to consider this now and having to look at it from a mandatory requirement to look at environmental sustainability, they have questions. They don't know exactly what to do. I mean, you mentioned um, NEAT Plus. That's, that's a great tool, but do people know how to use it? And I think you were, you're right in what you mentioned initially is that, you know, it, unless you have access to and you know about sort of those networks of people that are dedicated to looking at those things, it's a bit difficult to access it if you haven't looked at it before. The tools can be very complicated, um, but that's what we're trying to do and make it more accessible for sort of field-based practitioners to be able to use. And that dedicated expertise as well, I think is really necessary to make sure that, you know, if I'm a procurement manager in Yemen, I might not necessarily have the time or inclination to really focus on environmental sustainability. But all of the conversations that are taking place at my organization at the HQ level and taking place with you know, donors at the HQ level, those can be um, translated into something that I can do in my daily practice. And that's what we need to, I think, focus on when we look at going from policy to practice and what those tools really look like. Um, there's a couple examples that, that we've, uh, we've shared via the REC, um, the REC platform in, in the past. I mean, some of them relate to tendering criteria. You know, how do you add environment sustainability to standard um, uh, tendering criteria when you're, when you're issuing tenders? It's easy. There's a list. You can do a checklist, this kind of thing that really makes it like, okay, if I have to do it, at, you know, in my procurement manager role in, in Yemen, this is some tools that it can really, really get me there. Um, last thing that I want to mention before I stop rambling on is uh, is about the awareness of the different topics as it mutualization between organization and uh, do you um, encourage the your partners to uh, ask and to send a request to this platform and network to help them uh, regarding the um, expertise needed to fill up the minimum environmental requirements definitely yeah thanks so much for that question and actually I wanted to respond to um, some of the things that were mentioned in the in the first part because indeed we're speaking about uh, the information being quite fragmented or organizations not having the expertise in-house but indeed uh, you know um, other organizations perhaps having it and having the the capacity to to support others. Uh, in this vein, we actually um, funded a, a study that was trying to identify all of the different types of expertise available, but also help desks uh, and, and organizations that may have experts uh, in the organizations that could help others, you know, very, very um, wide ranging mapping actually led by Group RD. So thank you so much for that. And perhaps participants on, on this call were even involved in the interviews. Uh, but indeed, this is the, the idea of it is to help um, map this expertise and help the mutualization of, of efforts, mutualization of uh, already expertise existing uh, in the sector, but also beyond. So the mapping also looks uh, beyond um, some questions, uh, you know, um, are very much uh, along the nexus of humanitarian and development aid, and uh, especially when, when it concerns um, uh, climate resilience, which which I realize is not the, the topic of today's call, but it's the first commitment of the climate charter and, and this mapping looked at both. So, you know, we can seek out this expertise also outside of our immediate, uh, let's say, immediate um, sectors. And, and this is, I think, quite important. Uh, of course, 
uh, we may not um, have the immediate, let's say, connections to organizations that are not humanitarian. Uh, I mean, in terms of like environmental organizations or, or those that may traditionally have been supporting the development sector. But I think there's a lot of benefits also in looking outside and, and seeking this expertise a bit outside because indeed it's a new area for uh, us humanitarians. Um, but going back indeed to the ECHO requirements, so for sure, cooperation and mutualization will help implement them. Uh, this was already mentioned by Catherine and, and Camille as, uh, you know, areas that, that are uh, new and where not every organization has the necessary expertise to implement. Uh, for example, uh, we are now requiring that um, wash and, and shelter interventions, um, large scale ones, are preceded by an environmental screening. Uh, we don't prescribe the tool. Um, there are different tools available out there for this. Um, some were already mentioned. But indeed, part of the screening is understanding, for instance, the context, the environmental context for an intervention. And that information can definitely be uh, worked on together between organizations that are already present in the area and used to benefit uh, those organizations further in the design of other projects. So indeed, a mutualization around these kind of um, analyses, especially the context analyses, uh, would be very useful. Uh, another example could be, you know, now uh, ECHO is requiring that uh, food assistance is, um, uh, the energy needs are uh, accounted for as part of food assistance. But we are not prescriptive in terms of saying that the organization providing the food assistance needs to also provide the energy that can be done by another organization and it can be uh, you know um, a complementary set of, of projects but we just want to ensure that this dialogue is happening that uh, an organization that is doing the food assistance um, is aware of whether or not there are energy uh, programs in place and if not that they work with other organizations that could have that uh, competence to provide that energy. So in that sense, the requirement already has some implicit level of mutualization and cooperation there. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Carolina. And yes, it's true. I think we can rely on different kind of expertise, even without, um, um, uh, even with the private sector and also academia. Um, yes, we have to think about it. Uh, <laughs> Um, just to, uh, before moving on to the second part of our discussion, there's an interesting question in the chat box. Um, personally, I cannot answer, but uh, maybe you can. Um, so the question was related to the competition law issue. I don't know if uh, one of your organization or, or network uh, already faced this kind of issue. Catherine or Camille? Go ahead, Camille. I, from my side, no, I don't really have an example, but I, I wonder if maybe Rosalie, um, did you want to unmute yourself and, and mm. expand on the question a bit more? Hello. I'm sorry, I'm always having difficult questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, first of all, I, I, before I get into the competition, I'd just like to say that I think ECHO is super, super important, and I love that it's there. Um, I would be curious to know if there are similar regulatory approaches elsewhere in the world happening, and maybe uh, Carolina can expand on that. Um, with regard to competition law, it was just as you were talking about the, uh, you know, sharing resources and things like that. There, there are, you know, NGOs are falling under competition law or antitrust, as it's called in the US, um, and. I'm sure that must impact some organizations and perhaps it's it feels so counterintuitive to think about competition law when you when all organizations are really trying to do um, to help to help somebody in need uh, to then think about how competition can can fall into this is is feels kind of counterintuitive but when it comes to resources and sharing resources and collaborating on things, that is of course right at the core of that. And um, and it, it, I have, I'm struggling to identify an example, but you know, when you're talking about perhaps this one organization has the resources to hire a person 
uh, to do certain things, to run a database or, or something like that. And then that becomes available to other, um, it comes, you know, it's coming to a fine line there with regard to computation law. And that's, I was just curious about that. And it's, um, it's um, you know, if nobody has an example, then I'm glad to hear that because then it has obviously not come up yet and it's not a major issue. So I'm just happy to, to hear that. Maybe nobody has an example. Thank you very much, Rosalie, for this, uh, for shining the light on this uh, issue. I think this is very important and definitely we have kind of a competitive spirit uh, within our organization, at least to access funding. So, uh, yeah, so if we have any example, we will get back to you afterwards. Can I just uh, add to that? I think a little yeah. bit in, in terms of at least in the US, the, the antitrust laws have a lot to do with intent. Um, and to competition, I would imagine, are, are very quite similar. But I think the, one of the ways that we sort of get, I wouldn't say ar around some of the competition, um, is by formalizing those structures, right? Is, is formalizing those networks. And so, um, I mean, I could talk about the REC project. Um, you know, we have a partnership with the, the, the five different organizations, right? Global Logistics Cluster, WFP, DRC, uh, sorry, Danish Refugee Council, Save the Children, and the IFRC, we formalized that, right? And so the funding that we request is for that network of partners. And when we formalize that partnership and the information that we're going to be, uh, and the work that we're going to be doing under that partnership, it's formalized in an agreement and, and everything. So it is sort of legalized. I don't see, and another, a number of other organizations have, um, um, you know, coalition projects and, yeah. and consortiums, for example, um, where it's formalized in that way. I think in terms of the information sharing aspect of it, um, you know, if, if if a donor is willing to to fund one organization to collect information, um, and it will, be, it will be part of the purpose to share that information out as well, right? Yeah. So and I think it's all like formalized it's, in that way. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say exactly the same thing because like the REH, we also are formalized. And when I was mentioning the resource sharing that we did, specifically for the carbon project where we actually pulled some of our own funds to hire people um, that was within a consortium. Um, and it was you know, uh, very uh, formalized, like uh, how much money would be poured in uh, depending on organization's budget uh, and understanding with the understanding that everybody would be getting the same sort of support from the collective um, uh, resources that we hired, even though uh, the the budget poured in um, was not the same for everyone, but according to to their means, and um, and uh, actually often when we go into consortium to access funding um, from donors, uh, it's it's often a requirement of the of the funding that uh, of getting the funding that that we share like that the results and the the knowledge or the uh, um, yeah, the knowledge that we build uh, with within that uh, project and consortium then be shared publicly with as many as organization as possible. So, um, yeah, I, I actually wonder. Sorry, I'm just sort of jumping in, but I think it's a good question, um, and maybe it can help us jump off the next part of the the session. If I could pose it to Carolina, perhaps have you seen? I mean, because from the donor side, you see what everybody submits on a certain topic. Um, have you seen quite a lot of sort of competition for similar activities and resources as it relates to environmentalization and um, and this topic in the past year? And what do you do with that information when you do see competition for similar activities? I mean, do you share that with the different um, organizations applying for funding or is it just, you know, one is accepted and one is not kind of thing? I think it's interesting because that could be a, a significant challenge, right? Mm, definitely, yeah. So, well, there are two things uh, here in terms of where the possible competition, let's say, would would come from. So, the minimum environmental requirements are uh, aiming to minimize the impact of interventions that would, in any case, happen. So, we look first and foremost at what type of intervention it is that we that we receive. It has to be in line with what ECHO wants to support in a given area. So, you know, for example, it may be wash or, or, or subsets of, of that. And then 
usually actually so yeah sometimes there may be similar projects um or in terms of like um, a similar type of intervention in which case yes we would suggest uh, cooperation or the forming of a consortium and the same can actually um, be the case if we receive projects for example under our innovation funding so the the enhanced response capacity hip where uh you know organizations that um, may not realize that they're submitting similar proposals you know that get pointed in each other's direction with the suggestion to actually combine forces. But on, on typical humanitarian interventions, well, we don't really see standalone environmental projects as such because that's not the aim of the requirements. So again, it's more about the type of intervention and usually those are pretty complementary, especially in more, um, let's say, protracted contexts where I think everyone has more or less found their uh, their niche, let's say, and in emergency, it may be a bit different indeed, where uh, you know various organizations try to come in with similar responses, but then indeed we would uh, again encourage the, the consortia to form. Thank you very much, Carolina, for your answer. And yeah, I think it's good to know. Um, we're quite late. Uh, there's only 15 minutes left. I don't know if we have to stop at the at the 3 p um, 4 p.m. exactly. But yeah, just uh, let's move on um, to the um, to the practices and the cooperation between uh, donor and uh, the consistency of their environmental policies. Maybe, uh, Karina, I'm sorry because you're the only donor, so you're kind of the representative of the donor sector here today. Um, and we know that the donor policy and strategy have, um, have a strong influence on the practices on the operational actors on the field. Um, so can you give us a bit of an, uh, an overview of the donor, um, the, the environmental policies of the donor sector? Um, not, not only the DG ECHO, if you know, but also the, the other donors. Sure. I mean, I don't want to speak on, on behalf of others, of course, but uh, can definitely point everyone in, in the direction of um, two documents that have recently been, been released. So uh, one uh, is an analysis, thanks to the joint initiative, uh, comparing actually um, various donors' uh, environmental policies and what they contain. It's a very, very interesting read, so definitely check it out. And also, uh, more recently, the annual reports of the donor declaration signatories. So for those who don't know, this is um, a, an equivalent, a donor equivalent to the climate charter. So we have um, now uh, almost all of the EU member states, uh, plus Norway as a signatory of the donor declaration. We're working on getting more uh, donors on board. But uh, indeed, it's a, it's a set of um, commitments that mirror the climate charter, and we've uh, committed also to do annual reporting. So this, uh, thanks, Greg, indeed, for, for putting that analysis in the chat. Uh, I believe there's also a session next week on this actually organized by, by the joint initiative. Uh, but basically, what the picture shows is that many donors are, are um, either already working or starting uh, working on these issues. I would say maybe more are starting working on these issues than uh, those who have um, policies in place historically. Um, ECHO is the only one that has such requirements in place though. So even though uh, other donors may have guidelines or recommendations, uh, it's really only ECHO, as, at least at the project level, that goes as far in terms of the requirements and, and so specific. And for this reason, we also want to use those requirements as a basis for other donors to take inspiration from. So a lot of the work behind the scenes, uh, uh, you know, when we're not working with our partners is discussing exactly that with the other donors. Okay, so um, you mentioned the, the joint initiative work, um, the multi-donor um, policy landscape analysis on the environmental policy. And the, in that work, they mentioned four coordination platform to, between donors. Um, so do you discuss, within this platform, do you uh, discuss the, the issue of harmonization between the requirements? Because some of them have not requirements yet, only strategy or general recommendation. Um, but maybe uh, some of them have already uh, requirements. So how can we find a balance and harmonize to have less paper uh, and more action in the field? Definitely, yeah, that's um, one of the, the main topics of discussion, uh, for sure. 
I think the first step is understanding what we are doing between each other. And this is actually the main reason why, why for example, the informal uh, donor group on greening was formed so that we could come together on the specific issue and actually understand uh, what each of us is, is requiring uh, in much more detail, let's say. So really being able to exchange openly on what the requirements are that may not even be, uh, let's say, publicly available because they are internal internal policies. Um, but for sure, uh, you know, while we cannot impose anything, of course, on, on other donors, the idea also of the donor declaration is to come around these common commitments. And I would say that the, the objective for the next uh, years is to make those commitments more concrete because for the moment they're quite general. Uh, it's, you know, things like support the uh, environmental transition of the humanitarian sector, support our partners in that regard. But we definitely could uh, do more to actually uh, come around some more concrete, uh, concrete ambitions. For example, you know, um, the phasing out of, of uh, diesel generators, except where um, they are strictly necessary. You know, supporting, uh, um, prioritizing clean energy. These kind of commitments. Um, but on, in, in terms of contradicting requirements. Uh, we are definitely all ears on this. If if there is um, analysis that it, that is done by our partners that shows that different donors are are asking different things, for the moment we are not aware of um, these concrete examples. But when they do come up, we would definitely very much appreciate hearing about them so that we can work on rectifying that. Because um, at least for Echo, we definitely. Uh, at least the last thing we want is to have contradicting uh, requirements and asks uh, quite the opposite. So we would definitely be open to amend anything that um, that leads to such contradictions. Yeah, that would be very confusing for operational actors if there are contradictions or even sometimes not exactly the same duplication, but uh, uh, maybe uh, some of the other speaker, Catherine or Camille, or even the participants have examples of duplication or yeah, so I, I was going to say, um, so Action Against Hunger, uh, who is another member of the REH, I um, actually spent some time um, uh, at the end of last year, early this year, uh, doing a sort of a complete analysis of all the uh, donors' uh, requirements and recommendations on um, environmental policies. And we are pleased to say that there is no uh, direct contradiction so far. So this is um, already good news. I think uh, what, what we do see is um, more like different approaches where um, each donor will have their own sort of focus. Um, so we see a lot of focus on mitigation, but then we have um, a gap, for example, that uh, uh, has a whole topic on positive impacts of projects, which um, uh, is he's like Gek is so far the only donor that that uh, does that. So uh, for for organization for NGOs that would be um, you know probably a um, something that we would not work very hard on developing capacity for, and then suddenly be required to assess or. Um, we see also differences between focus on general um, uh, policies at, at organization level um, uh, by CIDA or, or GFFO and versus uh, project activities like what ECO did um, or uh, I think uh, financing as well is, is a, uh, ECO and GFFO are the only donors that have mentioned that they would be uh, willing to uh, fund some of the specific activities. Um, so I think so far um, it's like there, as I said at the beginning, uh, the work that uh, Action Against Hunger has done has not shown any contradiction, but the sort of different focus are kind of worrying as we move into that stage where uh, requirements will become more concrete and more specific because um, it's not so much duplication or, or uh, contradiction as sort of piles of requirements that would then, uh, you know, as we have to train our staff in the field on those issues, 
um, environmental, um, uh, like it's already a very complex uh, topic with tons of different um, parts to it. Like when we talk about procurement or waste or uh, environmental screening, or that those are different things and different um, uh, competencies. And if each donor requires specific things on, on different parts of, of, uh, of the uh, landscape of, of uh, environmental uh, action, then it would be, become very difficult to be able to respond to everyone, I think. And all the more so because it can um, sound like an additional layer yeah. uh, of other uh, issue, like the gender issue and, and the other. Catherine, you wanted to, get, to take the floor? Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to say, I mean, I think the ECHO MERs are kind of the, the first step, as I see it, um, in moving us a bit forward. And, and the joint initiative mapping, uh, the multi-donor landscape analysis is quite uh, quite useful and helpful in terms of seeing sort of where, um, where donors are moving and how the direction is moving. And I think also um, it, there's been two updates to that document so far, and, and I think the, the JI is going to continue to update that document and do that mapping. But what I see from conversations with our partners so far is that there's, I wouldn't say a fear, but there's a bit of a reluctance, I would say, um, and a concern that we the projects are not going to be accepted because we haven't gone far enough in environmental sustainability, or there's a limited understanding of what, um, you know, what a, a waste management or an environmental assessment is in the field. So I think while the, the MERs are definitely a first step and it's really, it's pushing that, it's pushing us forward as a humanitarian community to take on board environmental sustainability as sort of a mainstream topic. There's also a lot of work that needs to be done um, in terms of that awareness raising. And I know, I know Echo, you, there was a lot of trainings, there's operationalization documents, et cetera, that have, that have been done. But I think within the networks of NGOs and the networks of partners, we have a lot of, of work to do with our teams on the ground to make sure that they're really aware of what it means and how to mainstream some of those activities. And so sort of going back to what I mentioned initially of what the REC project is trying to do is taking you know, that policy to practice and taking those conversations at the global level and helping our field-based practitioners with some tools and, uh, and guidance that they can use to really sort of taking on board environmental sustainability as a, uh, you know, as part of their day-to-day -day practice. Yeah, sensitization is still um, a very, um, a step very essential and very required. Uh, what could be the role of the um, of your network, REH and the REC project or the Global Logistics Cluster to support the harmonization of the environmental uh, requirements? Well, I think the, the two things that we were just mentioning, like the, you know, just looking at what donors are doing and, and then giving feedback, like those kind of sessions as well, um, uh, would be like, so advocacy, I would say, I guess, mm -hmm. um, raising those concerns. I'm a, I'm a We've lost Carolina. Yeah. We lost Carolina for the advocacy parts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she sensed where, where the, uh, the uh, discussion was going and she just... Uh, her Zoom crashed in and um, uh, the affects her. <laughs> there's a recording. We can send her at the end. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, I think just uh, on our part, the the like the main part that the main thing that we can do is is uh, let donors know that um, we we do rely on their um, uh, requirements and their policies um, to to help um really operationalize what the, the work that we do inside our organization i think it's, it's sad that carol is not there at the moment but the the mer from from echo really uh were a huge boost to um having the conversation about uh the need for um taking into account environmental concerns inside in our projects um and definitely it's not the same when you go and 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 uh, you know, have a, a NGO policy that says we'll try to do better or have a, a donor like Echo telling you, no, you have to uh, actually be better. Um, and so I think we we do rely on them to uh, put forward those policies. And so telling them that and that it would be a lot more useful if they aligned on, on uh, requirements um, is the, the main thing that we can do, I guess. 
Yeah, I, I, I would just add to that. I would say advocacy is incredibly important, of course, um, advocacy with our donors, but I think also advocacy within our, our, our organizations and field teams. I think, um, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations with folks where they're like, oh, but, you know, there's these requirements that we have to now implement, but it's going to cost more to get greener products and it's going to cost more to change the specifications. Um, but in having those discussions with donors as well, I, there haven't been a lot of examples, and I, I welcome anybody uh, that's on this on this this call to to speak up. But there haven't been any examples, concrete examples so far, where a donor has rejected more sustainable products and specifications when it's been added to um, added to a project. And I think that's where it's it's our job to really make sure that we're moving from policy to practice within our own organizations. So really mainstreaming, really raising the awareness at the field level of what can we do to increase environmental sustainability. Because at the end of the day, if we don't make a change to what we're doing, we will continue to have a negative impact on the environment, which has direct consequences for the amount of humanitarian crisis that we are responding to. I mean, we've seen that. So we need to really make sure that we're moving moving this forward and mainstreaming it within our organizations, not only as a result of what the donors are doing, but because it's something that we need to do to avoid uh, environmental degradation. Thank you, Catherine. So you mean that we have to take risk and and uh, to apply and to take action and to apply environmental policies or environmental requirements, even if the donors uh, don't ask. Um, um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if uh, because Carolina didn't join, um, hasn't joined us. I don't know if you want to have the final words because Carolina is not here. So, Cami, you're yeah, I, <laughs> I guess we can. Um, I, I think for me, like, so the the this type of discussion is uh, truly uh, like very interesting and very important. I think it's also necessary to have maybe wider discussion on donor NGO cooperation. Because um, what we've talked today about is that, you know, donors cooperating between themselves to uh, align on requirements and NGOs co cooperating to um, answer those requirements and then, you know, a bit of communication in between. But I think as when we really truly um, look at what it would take um, to deliver truly green environmental like to truly green um humanitarian aid um we know that it will go like it would take more than just adjusting a couple of policies and um and adding a couple of requirements and the the change and the transformation that needs to happen in the sector is really um profound um, the same as for an entire society, I guess, if we want to truly address this um, this this massive uh, threat. Um, and so I think that this type of profound, meaningful change of just the way that humanitarian aid is brought to um, our beneficiaries and is delivered and um, can only happen if donors and NGOs actually sit together to think about what it would look like. Um, and we've seen some hints of that uh, kind of change um, with, uh, for example, what's happening in the DRR sector uh, around anticipatory action, where we are funding things differently and uh, working together differently uh, between donors and NGOs. And I think this type of sort of change must happen on a much wider scale um, uh, to, to truly change the sector. And so, yeah, uh, we have to invent those uh, like places to, to do this kind of cooperation. Thank you, Camille. And definitely the, uh, the, the ecological transition is not specific to the aid sector. And we need the other sector to to be more uh, under. Yeah, that's that's true. Like I was still within the sector, but yeah, we rely yeah. on the private sector for the for the procurement, for the supply chain, and so on. Um, so Catherine and Carolina, just to, to uh, give you the floor for the final words, if you want to add something, because we're late. Do Do you want to? Shall I go? And then I leave you. I'll leave you last but not least, Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I would just I would just echo um, sort of everything that's been that's been said throughout this this session. Um, there's a lot that, that that has been going on in terms of environmental sustainability in the past several years, and I think that there are uh, movements within the humanitarian community as well as the donor community to to really continue to move that forward. But I would just say that um, sharing of information, sharing of uh, activities and efforts is, is quite critical to make sure that we're all moving forward uh, in a harmonized fashion. And I would just encourage everybody to continue to um, to reach out and, and make sure that you are sharing and you're asking the questions about um, how you can implement environmental sustainability in your operations and what does it mean uh, in other contexts that you can learn from without having to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, so I would just encourage everybody to continue to do that. The REC is one platform in which you can do that. So you're always welcome to, to reach out to us and the, the team of environmental uh, specialists that we have, but there, there are many. So please continue to, to coordinate and collaborate with each other. Thanks. And this, this is also a call to join the, your network, both the REC project and the, and the REH. Carolina, do you want to add something as a final word? Sure, thanks yes, so much. We lost you, actually. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. My Zoom crashed twice. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. So hopefully now is as well. Um, well, indeed, I can only support uh, what has been said uh, both from uh, Katrin's and, and Camille's side and to say that hopefully also with the, the release of this mapping of expertise available, supports available, uh, this can also help in this mutualization and cooperation and also a commitment from our side that we as donors will continue uh, with this as well to uh, iron out any uh, any inconsistencies and, and, and contradictions in our own uh, requirements and asks. Thank you very much to uh, all of you and to the participants. And uh, so I hope that collaboration, cooperation, mutualization, uh, will go on for our project. So I think uh, Catherine and Camille, you uh, shared the, the link of your uh, the REH and the REP project. So I invite all the participants to have a look uh, at the website. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye everyone, have a nice day. Thank you.